Welcome to the Fripp Sales Series. This is your opportunity to meet some of my very smart friends. And the purpose of the Fripp VT Sales Series is one, to help you improve the quality of your relationships with your clients, improve your skills, and let's not forget your sales presentations. Today I have one of my very good friends who is also a friend of my brother, Robert Fripp, the famous guitarist. And we might just find out about what Tom Redmond, my guest, does when he's not working, helping professionals increase their sales skills. We have one area in common that we both like to do at rock and roll shows but more about that later. He is some of his very impressive bio. He's had over 40 years experience with generation and management of sales for the past 20 years. He's been in his own business assisting clients in, listen to how posh this sounds, designing systematic sales processes, processes maps, and management, or sorry, measurement protocols for new business development. He's worked with thousands of professionals. Even though his own career started in insurance, he helps people with all industries. He started with holding positions in global insurance brokers primary with commercial property in the casualty insurance segment. This is quite a mouthful, Tom. <laughs> you yes, acted as broker and account management on complex multi multinational accounts with clients, and you're very well educated. Uh, you have a BS in industrial relations and management, the prestigious Chartered Property and Casualty Underwriter, CPCU designation, and you're a certified instructor on overcoming call reluctance. You are the author of a book which is very helpful but lots of fun. And Tom, what is the subtitle of your book? Oh, the, the subtitle? A Sense of Humor is Helpful in all of this. If you're in sales, you better have a sense of your own. Well, good. So with that, let's give, let's give Tom a little applause. Thank you. And the next very important team member is, of course, uh, uh, Paul Griffin. And Paul is the director of client experience for Fripp VT and the moderator of all our webinars. So Paul, would you like to tell our friends how they can engage in polls and ask questions? Absolutely. On the right hand side of your screen, you will see a chat window. Within that chat window, you'll be able to ask your short specific questions throughout the call. In addition to the chat, you'll see polling questions come in occasionally. Just click your answer and then click vote. To get us started, we'll ask, do you sell business to business? Just select yes or no, and then click vote. All right, perfect. Now, Tom, can you give us a snapshot of anything about your career that was not in your bio? I think the uh, very good question. Thanks, for everybody, for being here as well, and, and many thanks for the invite, Patricia. Um, kind of the underlying uh, theme, if you will, is uh, an I guess this came to me, well, 20 plus years ago now that I really had desire to teach. And there was another aspect of that, which, which in the sales side is how can I help make people more valuable than they already are? And that was the, um, and, re and still to this day is kind of the underlying um, driver. I don't want to be too philosophical about it, but that really is kind of the underlying driver there. Good. And while we're being philosophical and 
our friends who are regulars might get a kick out of the fact that I we always rehearse and make sure we remove any distractions. And there is a, I would call it a banner, which isn't, I know, the right word, hanging behind you, Tom, that you don't want to take down because <laughs> it is. <laughs> well... All right, let's get right to it. This is a this is a um, uh, I'm a fan of the Dalai Lama, and this is a statement of his that you won't be able to, to see it from here, but from the from the screen. But um, it basically talks about how precious your life is. So I like to leave it up there, and as a as a good reminder on a day to day basis. And, Good. Well, life is precious and we appreciate the opportunity to help you, whether you are live or watch the replay. So let's roll up our sleeves. Tom, your process that you've taught thousands of people always starts with your goals. Can you pick yes. it up there? Yeah, it is the um, kind of the, the, the where you kick off from. And the goals a lot of folks have seen there's a lot of information in the general marketplace about goal setting and so forth. And we really kind of um, brought it to three or four different characteristics. Um, the first characteristic is that the goal has to be meaningful and that's meaningful to you, to your company, to the, uh, to your family community, whoever it might be. And the meaningful goal will also um, energize you and, the second aspect of the goal setting is that it has to be measurable. And this is where, in our experience, where we see a lot of the breakdown, um, specific measurable goals. And, and the, the way, particularly when I'm working with people who are brand new in business or just out of school or whatever it might be, um, one of the uh, ways I get them thinking about goal setting is, well, what do you want on your W-2? Mm. And pretty much everyone knows that number. So we start from there. So meaningful, measurable goals. The third aspect, the third characteristic, and this was the one that kind of shocked and amazed us, is that it, they have to be written. And that's not the shock and amazing part. The, the amazing part is that they, we found that they have to be written by hand. And I know, you know, I got, I got one of these too. And I know we don't write anything. We type it, we thumb it, and so forth. So all I say is put that on the side. All of the work we've done, we've done a lot of work in this, to, in this particular area. All the work we've done, really going back 100 years, obviously before all of the typing, is, is write these goals down. So meaningful, measurable goals. One of the other things that we would recommend on this is do not do more than five. Uh, we actually expand that a little bit. We like you to be thinking about five personal goals and five professional goals. And then you could put the incremental on, on the time. For example, uh, we like to spend a lot of time in the 90-day goals, maybe calendar quarter goals or annual goals or even, even multi-year goals are fine. Um, but, so that's, the, uh, that's a long answer to, a, to the question there. But that's the it, that's what triggers the energy level. It's what we call energy becomes available when these goals are, are written out this way. Now, energy becomes available. That reminds me of somebody. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and who does that remind me of? This is your, is this your brother? Yes. All right. And perhaps, and don't forget, we do have to tease them with what do you do when you're not just to add to the quality of your existence. Okay, all right. Should I tell me when you wish me to talk about that, and 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 I'll do it. All right. Okay. Well, well, let's give them more kind. So once you have your goals, mm -hmm. all right. What activities lead to results? Good. Okay. So the goals are set. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing that has to happen in the process. Remember, we, this is a process of sales. Yeah. Um, you can't skip a step. It's all outlined in the, in the book. Um, th there's a process to follow. The most successful individual salespeople, the most successful sales organizations have a systematic approach to bring business in the door. Systematic approach. Starting with or kicking off with the, with the goal setting. The next aspect of this is, all right, what are the activities that are going to be necessary to achieve the goals? So, for example, one activity is I better identify 
the prospects, the marketplace, the uh, market segment, lead sources, and so forth, that will be completing the um, or or really completing the aspect of goal uh, of a goal achievement. Another way of looking at this, I have a, a W two goal. Who in this marketplace are going to help me achieve that W two goal? Which which one of these prospects or market um, market segments and so forth? So um, that's the that's the next thing to do is identification. Uh, Defining, identifying the prospects and so forth, market segment is as I, as really as precisely as possible. The next aspect of this is um, contact. What's my contact strategy? Now, if you look at all three of these aspects together, goal setting, then I have the target accounts, market segment, and so forth. So I have my goals, I have the targets, and I have how I'm going to, uh, what my strategy is on contacting them. While all of this is critical and necessary and a very good baseline, I call this, these, these um, uh, segments here thinking great thoughts. I'm thinking great thoughts. I'm thinking about my goals. I'm thinking about my targets. I'm even thinking about how I'm going to contact them, but I haven't done anything other than that. Mm. So, this, so the activity is, yes, it's important, but nothing has happened outbound at this moment yet. And do many people get stuck there? Only happens 100% of the time. <laughs> Other than that, hardly ever, all right? Because okay. the next step is, if you continue on, on with this process, so I have my goals. What a guy. I got my goals. I know my targets. I even know how I'm going to contact them. And the very next thing that happens is call and contact reluctance. Mm. Now, see if you could relate to this. I'm about to make that contact. No, I think I'll go do something else first. This only happens 100% of the time. Only other than that, as I like to say, hardly ever. Um, I've become convinced after working in sales for this long, I've really became convinced that not making contacts is a natural part of the sales process. I'm about to make the contact. No, I think I'm going to go I'll, maybe next week, that kind of thing. I can go a long time on this one, but keep, keep it going. Well, it's interesting. Just so you know, 94% of our live audience, well, I don't know about those who watch the replays, do sell business to business. Oh, great. And Fabulous. I know you started, you, you started in insurance and now you've helped other clients. Mm -hmm. However, is call reluctance the same in every industry? Um, the quick answer is not exactly, but mm. pretty close. Mm. When it comes to 94% of our audience is business to business, I'm going to say call and contact reluctance only happens 100% of the time there. And you can really even reflect on it from last week, uh, reflect on it from yesterday, Halloween. Did I make all the contacts that I wanted to make yesterday? Of course not. I had to go to the Halloween parade here in town. I really did, by the way. <laughs> Think about for yourselves whether or not you've made all the contacts with either prospects, even your clients, lead sources. Last week, did I get to everyone that I really wanted to get to? And, and probably not. And, and perhaps it would be interesting if our, if our friends would like to type in the chat box what excuses they have for not making calls. Because I know I'm the first to admit I have my to-do calls and it's so easy. I could fill the chat box with my own excuses. Sure. But, all right, do you know what blocks most people? What Are you, you're, asking, you're asking me, yeah. Yes, okay. I, I'm asking yeah. you. Yeah. There's a, um, there's a company in Dallas uh, called Behavioral Sciences Research Press, and they are wonderful, and, I, and we do a lot of work with them. Okay. And in 1979, they um, had a, did a study for a very well-known uh, life insurance company and came to the conclusion that um, they, they, they discovered this overcoming call and contact reluctance. Um, and there were 16 different items that they recognized that block us from making these contacts. I'm about to make the contact. 
16 different items. The one that, and I'll maybe talk about two or three of these that are, are so common, but the number one cause of call and contact reluctance that is career threatening and cannot be sustained is called gold diffusion. Now, goal diffusion, what this is about is having too many conflicting priorities, even contradictory prior or even, even contradictory goals. For example, how, the, the one that I um, battle all the time with my clients, with their, with their salespeople, is you're asking your salespeople to not only pr do prospecting work and very important prospecting work, but you're also asking them to get involved with servicing the, the business. Uh, you're asking them, and it, and it could be a whole variety of other things, where, where what happens is the salespeople get distracted. And it's, it, by the way, I'd love to get distracted. Thank goodness I don't have to make another sales call. You know, I'm about to make the contact. Oh, I got this important paperwork to take care of. I'm, I, I, the one I gave yesterday, I have this important, uh, I have these prospects to contact. Well, my grandson is in the Halloween parade. How can I miss that? All right. Now, I can, what I do is I can work around that. That happened to be one holiday. But the, the issue is where this is a chronic condition, where it's an everyday thing. And a temporary gold diffusion happens to all of us. The parade yesterday, the one I like to, to use a lot, Patricia, is where we moved our uh, office a year ago. Yes. And what a pain that is. And where's my, you know, how does things work? And where's the modem? And blah, blah, blah. But it stabilizes. That's going to be temporary goal diffusion. What I'm talking about is the one that's, as I say, chronic and everyday thing, where it absolutely takes takes us out of the game, and that's the number one um, item for um, for salespeople. So, so for example, we have a uh, a policy at our company, a practice at our company called Five by Five, mm. that I'll be making five prospect contacts by 5 p.m. every day. And this webinar is not one of them, all right? This is not one of them, all right? So five by five. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but this is our 21st year. In 1996, it was 10 by 9, 20 by 10, 30 by 11. I had no customers. I better make contact. Mm. So five by five works for us. So the point is, for, for all of our listeners and, and viewers today, what, what are your numbers? How many by 5 p.m.? What about by per, for the week? How about how many referrals can I ask for by, by Friday uh, or by, you know, whatever the, whatever, remember, meaningful, measurable, here we are. Five by five is, uh, work, works uh, well. Well, according to your training, mm -hmm. if you called five existing clients just to see how they're doing and ask for a referral, mm -hmm. does that count? Uh, yes, I count it, yeah. All right, I would good. count that, sure. Yeah. So because... Call because why I'm saying that is because um, th this is also a prospecting activity. Um, I love referrals because it, they're so rich. Everyone kind of knows they're so rich that your hit ratio starts at 50% and goes up from there. The, the thing that I love that, that about referrals and, and where it's been so rich is that I call it one-to-one -one, where I can make a contact with a referral and I get to the right person, and I basically get an appointment every time, one-to-one, -one, as opposed to seven contacts get to the wrong person on, on whatever other, um, if, particularly on larger accounts, where I'll be working on larger commercial accounts going after them, seven, seven contacts. It's amazing. Seven contacts, I finally got to the person that says, okay, you're, I'm the right one, you know, that kind of thing. Because I know you, you, you know, reading your bio, you had these enormous accounts uh, how, I mean how long realistically how mm. long before you identified them to getting to somebody on average well it, 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 it's, it's a great question because what I found and this is something I stumbled upon Mm. Um, that didn't, I mean, I'm, it's, it's, it, in retrospect, it was brilliant. No, it wasn't. I just found it, and you know, I fell on it. Um, take a, for example, we do a lot of work still in the insurance industry because I came out of that industry, and I know the language and so forth. So I'm calling out an insurance company, a massive, massive company, billions of dollars of revenue. How am I going to get to these folks? Well, 
It turns out, and this is probably true in many large, large uh, organizations, large corporations, they have a variety of divisions. And these divisions are almost like state-owned separate companies. So if I'm working with XYZ Insurance Company and they have, I, there was one I was working with had 29 different divisions. Mm -hmm. And I wound up working with 21 of them, I think. As, as Think about it as, as separate accounts, that kind of thing. So that's one way of, uh, of, of trying to approach that. Mm. But we'll always be approaching the people who are really involved in sales, uh, the marketing folks, the sales folks, and things like that, the, the, the top people in that, in whatever that discipline happens to be with those companies. Is that clear? I hope I'm clear on that. Sure. Yes, which leads to another question, but yeah. I want to hear from Paul. For those people who are honest enough to give us what some of their uh, their excuses are would you read them i see one of my very good friends rich i believe you have just retired so everything i have been encouraging you to do for years you now rich have no excuse for not doing it i won't mention his last name he knows who he is okay paul what are the excuses all right we have do not feel prepared Mm -hmm. Should practice first and haven't. Yeah. Too early, then it's too late. It's amazing how they overlap. Excuses, not knowing who to call if I don't have an appointment. Mm -hmm. Too many priorities is a big issue, not focusing on the purpose of the call. Mm -hmm. Lack of confidence, I'm actually going to reach people. Lack of confidence, I'm actually going to reach people or fear that I'm going to reach people and I will fumble. Oh. Asking for business definitely have too much on my plate to handle. I can always find something else that needs to be done. I need to study the sales process, or I need to study the sales process more before I make this call. And finally, I have run out of contacts. All right, very good. These, these are terrific. Now I can name the type of call reluctance for every one of those, but let me just pick a few. Okay. The one about preparation. It's called over-preparation. Now uh, you hit one, that is my key Number one, I am a toxic, chronic over-preparer. Mm. And where did this come from? And, and what I want you to also recognize is that these core reluctance tendencies, these characteristics, are not any type of a, of a character flaw. We learn these. Mm. So, for example, when I was a young guy in my early 20s, and I was going out and um, making a sales call, I'd be going out the door, and my boss would say to me, now, my boss was a good guy. He did hire me, so he was a very good guy. <laughs> And um, I'm going out the door, and he said, um, and he would say, Tom, have you thought of everything? And my answer was, as a 25-year-old, my answer was, I've thought of nothing. His name is Jack. He's on the fifth floor. He bought, and that time I was in the insurance business. I said, his name is Jack. He's on the fifth floor. He buys insurance, not from us. What else could I possibly need to know? And, of course, I was totally underprepared. But my boss kept reinforcing this. Did you think of everything? Did you? I got so good at it that I ultimately got promoted. Mm. And eventually I had salespeople working for me. And guess what I'm saying? Did you think of everything? Have you, are, you, are you totally ready? So right now, maybe not so much on the East Coast right now because it's a little late, but there are hundreds of producers, salespeople, over-preparing because they hung out with me. I passed it on. So in all organizations, there is a... A, a, a pattern of call and contact reluctance. We are carriers of it. We teach it to each other. It's over preparation one. The one about um, uh, it's the wrong time. This is what's called yielding. This is all came out of these folks in Dallas. It's called yielder. I'm about to make the, the contact. No, I don't want to bother them now. It's too close to lunch. It's, it's right after lunch. Uh, it's Monday. It's Friday. It's too late in the day. It's too early in the day. It's a, there's a holiday coming up. You know, I mean, what, it, we're just right after the holiday. I don't want to buy It's summer. Let's not contact them in the summer. So you, I'm glad we're laughing. This only costs people their careers, you know. Um, so there's a Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock that you're ready, to, and I'll do it then. This is what the, what the yielder does. This is what the, the yielder is about. Um, I'm trying to think of the, uh, some, oh, the one about, I don't know what to say. That's a very, very common one. I'm not, uh, or 
the, the, the over-preparation was touched on. What if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? Well, there's a very simple response to that. I'll be found out for the Lutheran. It's never to sell again. This is what's going to happen. Because all of these, the, I'm, I got to get more ready. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all. Uh, what, whatever that happens to be, these are all the reasons that block us. However, the good news is there is an assessment to, to tell you what this is all about. And there are remedies. There are remedies to go with this. And what I was surprised when I read in your book, when you took the assessment, you were amazed because you didn't think you had coal reluctance. I was astonished. I was astonished because the statistics at that time, this was the early 90s. Mm -hmm. I was at that point in my career working on large commercial accounts yeah. in the New York metro area. So there's an unlimited supply. By the way, there's an unlimited supply everywhere. We have very rich economic conditions. So I, my goal was to have uh, 16 new business appointments a month. That was the goal. And it took me 156 contacts to get 16 appointments. And at, at that time, it was all cold call for me. So I can get an appointment about one out of every 10. Yeah. So I got a call one day from someone who told me I had call reluctance. And I said something stupid like, no, 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 no. I'm the best at this. I get 16 appointments a month. I got 156. And she said, no, no, you have call reluctance. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. I was very mature about it. Yeah. So I took the assessment and it absolutely floored me. I remember looking, I sat down with her. It was at the Algonquin Hotel in New York. In sure, the lobby, I walked by it, yes. In the lobby. It changed my life. She goes through my report with me, the assessment, and it absolutely floored me. It was that accurate. And, um, and it wasn't like you got a little of this, a little of that. It nailed me. And, um, and, and the big one that I found was one about over-preparation. So I then gave it to my sales team. I had about 20 people in the sales group at that time. And sure enough, they found individual types of, of reluctance, of, of behaviors, characteristics. But the main one was I was there was a pattern of over-preparation at, at where I was working. I was teaching my group how to not make contact. I'm the sales leader teaching them how to do this. Changed my life. And I'm totally amped up about it, as you can still see. As a matter of fact, just one little add-on about the, in the book, uh, I contacted Behavioral Sciences and said, I want to put a chapter in my book about you folks. Mm -hmm. And they said, no. Well, then we get that question all the time. You can't do it. So I went ahead and wrote the chapter and I sent it to them and they said, yes, it's so compelling. It was very, very cool that they, they agreed with it. But I ignored them and because I had to have it in there yes. it, because it's the process to follow. And we didn't even get to metrics yet. I'd like to chat on that. Okay, on sure. So the process to follow and here's why and here's the metrics and here's why you won't do it. And we have to have all three of those and, and overcoming why you won't do it. All right. Well, so I, I know everyone listening is going to want to know how can they do this assessment. Mm -hmm. So they just email you, is that? Yeah, the best, the best thing to do is uh, email us, my, me, and then I'll respond back to you. I'll give you a little outline of what, what it would take. And there's a, there's a cost to it. it. It is, and the cost is above zero. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, but it's incredibly reasonable in the sense of that these particular um, uh, things that are blocking you and also a pl application of the remedy. In fact, there's another book that goes with it called mm -hmm. The Psychology of Sales Call Ah, uh, Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. And make sure that you're not going to have to read 400 pages of this book before I make my contact. That's call reluctance. So I think I'll read the whole book. For, no, you won't. All right. Um, and when we get, if you go through the and get the assessment, I'll be able to go through here, do this one first, this one second, and this one third. And it has the effect it will have is only on the balance of your career. Other than that, hardly ever. Okay, you know? good. So certainly, uh, Paul, I know you can uh, put Tom's email address in the chat box. And what we might want to do actually is is just let everybody know when they watch the replay of to do that as well. Sure. So, Paul, are there any other 
comments or questions before we go to the metrics? Well, there was one more excuse. Selling myself is so personal and getting turned down becomes personal as opposed to selling a product. And then we have a question from Bill Brown. Do you anticipate coming out with a Kindle version of your book? Oh, no. Uh, the quick answer is no. There's no margin in it. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah. I get that question a lot. You can, I have to sell the book at 10 cents a piece, you know, or less. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but Bill Brown, uh, oh, I'll lend you mine if you really can't afford the discounted because a friend of Fripp can happen for fifteen dollars. You said, right. yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, perfect. So now, okay, so let's just do a quick review. We start with goals, mm -hmm. and then we. But then, then you have the active. Well, your your goals, identification of those organizations that are going to uh, feed the goals, complete the goal, yeah. which are the customers, yeah. um, how you're going to contact them, whatever those strategies might be, and then overcome why you won't do it. Exactly. And what blocks you from that. Good. And then where does the metrics come Now, the metrics come in in a variety of different ways. That's the, the third leg of this. We have a process, we have metrics, and in overcoming why you won't do this. Um, the metrics, what we really focus on are the leading indicators of sales success. So let me define this a little bit. We already, all of you already count what you sell, what you've sold. I imagine, can you imagine, I, I'm, I have this idea someday, I'm going to walk into a place and they'll say, what a great idea, we should count what we sold. No, it's already done, all right? That's a la lagging indicator. What we like you to focus on are the leading indicators. What were the activities necessary to bring to that sale to a, to a proper and a, a positive conclusion? And we, we try to get it down to like three items, three leading indicators. And now it can vary with different industries and so forth, but I'll give you the three. We tried to get it to zero, but it can't be done. So we got it to three. The first uh, leading indicator is number of appointments. How many new business appointments am I going to have or by a monthly basis, whatever it is. Now, this is also has to be based on the mathematics, the mathematics of what are my sales goals, X dollars, or what do I want on my W-2? And then it's a matter of backing into, well, how many accounts do I have to land? What's the average size account? What's the compensation plan? What's, is there an incentive in this? And so on. Um, hit ratios and, and all of those um, uh, those items on that. Another um, a statistic that's overlooked a lot is how many new business appointments do I need in order to bring one of them to the proposal stage? All right. So in in my case, it was four. I had to have four new business appointments and was able to get one of them to the proposal stage. All right, now the other three may eventually get there, but the timing is different and there's a lot of different reasons for this. So, metrics. Number of new business appointments is one metric. A second metric is how many accounts do I have in the proposal stage, in some stage of development? That's what we're driving at there. We're really, it's thinking in terms of the proposal stage and what's the dollar amount on that? So it's only three items. Number of new business appointments, the accounts in the proposal stage, how many of them, and what's the average. You have to look at what the income might be or it could be personal income to you or something like that. That's it. That's all you have to look at. Because what you want to look towards is when if I have those metrics, for example, I knew, let's get back to these personal examples. I actually do this. Huh? Personal example, if I needed 16 new business appointments a month, that was based on how what's the average size account, what's my hit ratio, or, and, and I needed to bring four accounts to the proposal stage on a month-to-month -month -month basis. So I knew that if I only had 10 appointments in a month, I'm not going to make it. So I will make a course correction based on that metric. All right, I'm only at 10 appointments a month. I'm not going to make it. I better, I better make sure that I can focus my attention on getting appointments. What's the high payoff activity? Do some prospecting, Tom. Get this other stuff out of the way. I'm about to make that contact. No, I think I'll go this other stuff. No, I won't. I better get my metrics in place so I can make a course correction here. 
And it's the same thing. How many accounts am I going to bring from that suspect or prospect stage to the proposal stage and, and the numbers around that? All right, so effectively what the metrics, so we have the, we have the goals, we have the target accounts, and we, and we have the overcoming call reluctance and so on, but the metrics will give me this ability to do course corrections. And, and the way we can set it up, in fact, it's on our website as well, you can tap into that. It's an Excel sheet, the magic of Excel actually gives you graphs to work on, it's very simple. Um, three, three numbers that you should be counting anyway. How many appointments do I have and what's the amount of business that I have in the proposal stage? And there might be some modifications to that, but that's, that's been pretty, um, pretty accurate for, for lots and lots of folks. Well, I'm sure many of us, myself included, are, are hanging our heads in shame that we don't measure all these. Is there enough? A sense of humor is helpful. A sense of humor is... <laughs> Yeah, yeah sense sense of humor and then don't go into this whole thing about um, I really am a loser. I wish I didn't go to this webinar today. You know, yeah. cut that out. <laughs> All right, should we go to your website, uh, Tom, and just show people where they can get the various items? Sure. So, Paul, if you can go to the Redmond Group Inc. And, and if you Google, Tom, make sure it has the ink or yeah, you, you will be at the wrong group. There's another Redmond group, but they're very nice people, I will say. They're, that's mine. They're that's used to I'm getting your calls and saying, why can't we buy your book? They've Tom, been very, yeah, yeah. All right, so there's another very funny part, and you, you have a list of the excuses for the oh, day. Yes, the very famous sales excuse of the day, all right? <laughs> including one of the sales excuses of the day is reading Redmond's sales excuses of the day. Oh, I see, yes. And make a contact. Uh, all right. I that, think that's my prospects are tired at this time of the day. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, it's people you've never spoke to, never, you never met them, and you know they're tired. This is what happens. Good, so they can order the book. Well, how, how do they get the Friend of Frit discount? Do the same thing. Just send me an email, and we'll we'll take care of it from there. Okay, good, yeah. perfect. Or if you go through Patricia, that's that's fine as well. Yeah, we'll, that's we'll make good. sure we get yes. good. So then there's the click to your our sales coach newsletter. What mm -hmm. do we get there? Well, we have a um, a variety of uh, sales coach newsletters on lots of different topics. Mm. Uh, everything, well, everything I can think of, uh, goal setting, referral harvesting, overcoming core reluctance, metrics, I mean, all the things we've, we've talked about. Okay, good. All right, perfect. Well, if you can come back to, to us, Paul, because I have a, a question that I thought about, but I haven't discussed it with you, so we're going to get the raw, unplugged answer. All right. And then I know I have my version of it, uh, but that is when you had these four sales appointments, and these are big accounts worth yes. mm -hmm. a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Obviously, these people were buying insurance from somebody else, and they were, I would think, at least somewhat satisfied. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you said or did that made them give up a relationship to do business with you? Well, the, that's a that's a very good question and a, and a long answer. Let me let me break it down into a couple of parts. All right. So if you can picture this, that I um, I mentioned, I'll get one account out of four. Now that's only in the proposal stage. Whether they bought or not is is a, a little bit different. But I wanted to get them to the proposal stage. I needed to time it back. Yeah. So I would walk into four accounts, four different commercial accounts, and the first one, the, this account would say to me, uh, I'd be trying to get a proposal, you know, I have them agree to a proposal, and they say to me, um, how's never will we want a proposal from you? All right? mm -hmm. Now that's a pretty good non-buy signal, no buy signal. So I would walk away. The second one I would walk into, I'm thinking, I don't want to give a proposal on this one. I don't want this client. You know, I'll see you later. So, so those two are, are yeah, that's, that's the way it's going to be. The third one, I go in and maybe there's um, 
the timing is not right, there's a qualification issue. For example, Patricia, what you just said, maybe the, the relationship they have with the existing, my competitor is so strong, I'm gonna say, well, I'm gonna stay in touch. If something will go wrong, something will change, and then we'll, we'll figure this out as we go, or something will change in your marketplace, something will change in your economy, something will change with your customer base, something will change with you, whatever that might be. But I'll stay in touch because something will change. So that's the third one where it's not the timing is not right or so something like that could be. And the fourth one is, yeah, we're ready. Mm. We got this. Um, I think we're, we'll be happily ask you for a proposal. However, there's a whole aspect that is another part of the, of the process map, which is in the book, on qualifying the account. Um, and when do I walk away from this business? When am I going to recognize that this unqualified account is blocking me from a qualified account. Mm -hmm. And if my pipeline is full, this is a very cool thing to keep in mind. If my pipeline is full of, of qualified accounts, two things happen. Mm -hmm. My fear diminishes and my qualification standards are actually not only sustained, they're, they're improved. As opposed to when my pipeline is empty, my fear increases and I'll work on anything, you know, how desperate are we? You know, maybe, I, maybe I'll get lucky, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. So in spite of the fact that the fourth account that I'm working on looks like there's an opportunity for proposal and so forth, I still want to make sure that they're meeting my qualification standards. Uh, and is, is, is there an opportunity? Am I going to be competitive? I mean, you know, all of those kind of things go into this. And a lot of that has to do with just knowledge of your marketplace, experience level, and so forth, because I've made those mistakes. These are mistakes that I've made you never have to make. Yeah. But there, it can be very difficult to walk away from a piece of business, particularly if you don't have anything you're working on. I call it, by the way, when you're working on, um, on an unqualified account, I call it the zen of sales. Mm -hmm. Look busy, do nothing. This is what happens to us. You know? we look, at least we look busy. You know, we're working on things, you know, but we're really not. So is that helpful, Patricia? I'm not well, sure. Yes, I yeah, that, that is helpful mm -hmm. because it's always useful to know what people who've been very successful, the approach that they mm -hmm. take. Uh, at one seminar where I, I was actually speaking at a conference, one person talked about if you have a request for, for a proposal mm -hmm. and you realize that they've had a very good business for the last three years with a company and they go out for bid every three years and they say very often it's just they're going through the process they're going to stay mm -hmm. with the vendor and there are some situations i one i've wasted time doing it because i wasn't going to get the business mm -hmm. it might help the other company say well you've got to lower it by three percent right. or something like this but for now, and maybe it's me, I make the judgment, this is not worth my time going through the judgment. Right, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it gets to, because I asked the question, who else is working on this? Well, we yeah. have 19 other vendors or we have 19 other relationships. And I'm saying, well, make that 18. Yeah. I'm not going to work on it. All right. And by the way, the sometimes that even makes you more attractive. Whereas, yeah. well, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to pass on this one here. Yeah, and the re and part of the reason is if you follow the if you follow a process, this process I've I've laid out here and it's worked very well for lots of time and lots of people. So I know that it's proven to me. Uh, if if you have enough going, you're able to turn business away. It's really okay. Mm. It's really it's really actually a, a kind of a wonderful position to be in. Well, I know you have had the luxury of being in that position for a few years. <laughs> Well, let's just say you overcome your call reluctance. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're watching your metrics. You've got your goals, and you are in front of a really hot prospect. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, what do you say? Ah, uh, at okay. least, Paul, uh, Paul, get ready. Because we have one answer, Tom. Now, I want to hear what you say after. But, of course, part of the FRIP organization mm -hmm. is our online virtual training. 
it's highly interactive and it focuses on powerful persuasive presentations so what we would like to do is give you just a quick demo of the superstar sales presentations uh, course in in Frip VT and anyone live or watching the replay if you want to go to fripvt.com and you can sign up for a free trial you have a chapter on sales a chapter on openings and a chapter on stories all which will help you with your your sales conversations and presentations so Paul is showing you what you will see when you sign up for your free trial and uh, the first steps to persuade influence and inspire it doesn't matter whether you what you're selling your services you're selling for a large company and then we are going to go to the training center so click on the training center because we have some of our VT users watching in and this is course is our account but you will now notice not only do you have three new new courses we now are taking these sales webinars chunking them into 20 minute segments and putting them in it is certainly putting them in an area of your Frit VT account. So we have the sales series, the Frit VT user meeting, anything on presentation skills. And for professional speakers or those who wish to be, we have a whole segment of interviews with people who can help you with that. So for now, we're gonna to go to the normal Frit VT content and we're gonna give you a taste of the interactive FRIP virtual training, superstar sales presentations. And don't forget, take your trial. Welcome to Superstar Sales Presentations, The Inside Secrets. In this course, you will learn the secrets of making your sales presentations more compelling. This will give you a seemingly unfair advantage over your competition. If you're ready, click the Start Training button. Life is a series of sales situations. Every day you sell yourself, your ideas, your value, your point of view, your product or your service. Every sales conversation and presentation is a missed or captured opportunity. If you sound the same as everybody else, you have no advantage. This course is looking at what you are learning about effective presentations, specifically as it relates to the sales process. All right, so you will find that is the, 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 if you are interested in online learning, I promise you there is no other platform that is as attractive, engaging, and that definitely is the easiest most convenient quickest way to improve your skills at the most cost effective way for example tom a year's access to frit vt is similar to what i charge for one hour of coaching on the mm -hmm. phone so anyway that is so i certainly feel when everything else is being is equal you got a good proposal with a great company with great references and mm -hmm. exactly the same the presentation the conversation can give you an edge yes. and, and it's not just product knowledge it's much more mm -hmm. it's what, what is of most interest to the person you're talking to the one secret of getting people interested in what you have to say is focus your content from their point of view Right. being aware of what are their interests, what are their challenges, what are their priorities, and design your presentation around their interests, not yours. So that's the Frit philosophy on this. So going back to you, in the trenches, you've mm -hmm. got these appointments. Is there any advice you would give your team on actually what to say? It's it's a it's a parallel to what you're talking about, Patricia. The, the way that I would uh, kind of position it is I want to know the objectives of the client. 
the objectives. Now, and I'm thinking about their business objectives first, yeah. and maybe even their personal objectives. What, where do you see yourself in five years? Those type of things. Because once we, and this is a weakness, by the way, and have I identified the objectives of the client? And once I've identified those, we build everything around that. We build, we, we put our services, expertise, energy level, creativity, and so on, on achieving their objectives. We also make sure, and I know you've done this, we make sure that we've, identi we, we've uh, communicated with the prospect, these are your objectives, one, two, three, four, five, so that when we're actually making our presentation, we say, okay, remember objective number one, here's how we're solving that, here's how we're attacking the objective number two, and so on, and that's really the, so that's, how am I doing, is that? <laughs> Good. No, that's very good. Okay. And, and, right. But it's not only it's not only do you ask good questions. Mm -hmm. You're really oh, clear that they know you listened, mm -hmm. and this is not the standard. Good morning. My name is Joe Blow. I work right. with this insurance company, or I work with this training company, and this is what we do. This is mm -hmm. obviously this is an important part of the process when you finally have someone know what you're going to say and what they would care when you actually get there. sure mm -hmm. perfect all right now paul are there any specific questions that we need to answer well rich did say it wasn't really a question he says the first thing that you say is tell me quick and tell me true Tell me, tell me. Okay. But tell me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bill, um, Bill had mentioned that the in regard to the Kindle book, it wasn't the money. He just likes to read things online. Oh, I got. I understand. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. It, Bill, a few dollars is not a problem for Bill. No, 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 no. I was thinking about my money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I understand. Oh, I really understand that. Yes. Uh, now, Tom. Uh, because you're really concerned with what the Dalai Lama says and he wants you to have good quality of life, what do you do for fun? Well, this is a complete setup question. Uh, I'm also a musician and um, uh, Patricia's brother, Robert, was my, I had played guitar for quite a long time, but he was my first official guitar teacher. So you kind of start, I started at the top, if you will. Yeah. And um, we've been very, very close friends for the last uh, 31 years. I've, I've worked with him and I traveled around the world, um, performed in the orchestra of crafty guitarists in a variety of places. And uh, uh, of course, there is absolutely no money in it. So yeah. there, I'm not gonna be able to feed my family if I was going to be a guitarist. Um, <laughs> Which Robert would agree with, by the way. Yes. And so, you have anyway, your own band called? Yes, I Oh, no. But now we're off to it. Aren't I? Yes, I have a band. And do I have to go through with this? Well, what is the name? Oh, boy. Now we're into it. My band is called the Hellboys, all right? Don't I? And this is how we, uh, how we dress as well. Don't I look like the Hellboys? <laughs> we have two albums out. And they're terrific. And Robert plays on all of them, along with some other wonderful, wonderful musicians. I'm the only one that's not a professional musician. I'm amazed. Well, how did they, how did they uh, join the Hellboys? I had a goal. I set a goal. I want these players in the, um, uh, in the band. I contacted them. I overcame my call and contact reluctance. I gave them a proposal. And I made the sale. How else can I say it? I followed the same process. Exactly. And what you once told me is when they asked you what do you want us to do, now you gave them creative license by yes. saying. Yeah, yeah. What I said, well, the, the bass player, some of you uh, know uh, Peter Gabriel. Well, the bass player is uh, Tony Levin, who is uh, the bass player for Peter Gabriel. I mean, this is like amazing. Yeah, and he came crimson and so on, and a wonderful, wonderful man and musician. And he came into uh, to the studio, and uh, right off of Peter Gabriel's jet, he was into the studio, just did a worldwide tour, and he said to me, "Tom, uh, how do you want me to play on your album?" And I had an answer. I was shocked, like, "Uh oh, now what?" 
I had the answer. It flew in the window. And I said, Tony, just play what Peter Gabriel will not let you play. Yeah. And then he said, it's kind of wide open. I said, you have no idea. Do what you yeah. want to do. And that's how the Hellboys operate. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> now, just taking that one concept, often when clients ask me what my my way of business or my mm -hmm. way of billing i often say look i am the easiest person you're ever going to do businesses this is what we normally do however it is adaptable to what works for you is that okay always yeah all right, all right yeah. good yeah well uh, if there uh, paul if there are no more specific questions for tom Let's remind everyone, if you, if you would like to know about the call reluctance, you can email, you can email Tom, he'll get in touch with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can certainly give Tom the list of who's signed up for this, this conference. Uh, but certainly, but Paul, I do believe you put Tom's email address in the chat box. I did, and it's still up there, so they'll be able to see it. Okay, perfect. Thank Good. you. And uh, if you are not a Frit VT member, we certainly hope you'll go take a free trial. If you are a Frit VT member, call in and take advantage of all the new content we've just added. And of course, Tom Redmond Inc. or Redmond Group, Redmond Group Inc. Inc. The website, Redmond Group Inc. Paul will also make sure that you have that. And so let's just small actionable items that get results tom okay i think the first one is set a goal to set the goals if you if you have your goals in place wonderful if not set a goal to set goals how about one week from today noon your time all right Good. so there's actionable items the second actionable item is let's really take a, a good look or at the inventory well, where is it? What do I have in the proposal stage? Am I really tracking my appointment levels? What about my marketplace, the, the, uh, the market I'm after? Let's do a real good re kind of review of that. I have my goals now, which of these customers or prospects are going to feed those goals? And the last part of this would be, and it's an action of, I mean, a lot of this is going to be of an internal uh, review, if you will, an inventory. Uh, what's blocking me from making these contacts? Be really honest with yourself about it. Um, I'm about to, if you're happily sitting at your desk in your office at, not making contact, happily sitting there not making contact, what's really underlying this? What's the, write it down and then um, and we can figure out the, um, the remedies for that as well. All right. Good. And with that, Tom, it is always a joy and a pleasure Thank you, Patricia. to you. I certainly appreciate that you allowed uh, many of our friends to come in and listen and as a replay. And if you if you do not regularly read my blog, you just mm -hmm. go to fripp.com and click at the top on the blog. Before we interview our friends like Tom, we always run a couple of their, of their articles or mm -hmm. their blog posts. And afterwards we go and embed the video of this recording into that blog post. Right. And when you get the replay link, certainly feel free to share it with all your friends. We are very happy to share Tom's uh, information and idea and get to know new people who didn't even sign up. So with that, thank you, Tom. Thanks, thank Patricia. you very much, Paul. Let's and all you, Paul. wave to the Thanks, our everybody. friends. Remember, all learning is repetition and reinforcement. Listen to this again. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.